one thing that that I'm really impressed with about what you're doing is measurement. Uh, my little known fact, my undergraduate degree is in mathematics and economics. And the reality is in the world of training and development and HR, there's been a real hesitancy to measure impact. Why? How you do training programs, everybody claps their hand. Daniel and I have done this. You get 4.8 out of five and everybody cheers and they pay you lots of money and they get pictures made, right? And that's basically all there is. I really commend you for having the courage to measure things because you've got to confront real leaders on their actual behavior. And not only do you document winners, you've got to be documenting some losers too. How did you get the backing and or courage to do this? By the way, to be honest, most people in our field do not have the courage to do what you're doing. Thank you, Marshall. Um, well, I'll tell you, uh, I am sponsoring a longitudinal study. And the study simply is um, trying to measure the relationship between a leader's emotional intelligence, the quality and strength of a leader's emotional intelligence, with producing a sense of belonging, a sense of identity with their direct reports. And it's longitudinal because we have three phases. So let me just tell you, we start with an assessment and it's Dan's and Richard uh, Boyatzis' uh, assessment, a 360 assessment. And we've given this 360 assessment to about 200 leaders. And we uh, record a base baseline. What is their emotional intelligence baseline? We give surveys to their direct reports, about 1,500 of them. Uh, and these are leaders, supervisors, frontline leaders, and managers as well, and measure their sense of belonging. And we have found a statistically significant correlation between a leader's emotional intelligence, the so strength of their emotional intelligence, with the strength of a sense of belonging among their direct reports. And with that, we understand that you know, we also have an annual Gallup survey. And we also measured whether there's a correlation with belonging and engagement, and there is. So we have uh, statistical significance showing a correlation with strong emotional intelligence and high engagement levels with their direct reports. We're not done though, because we're entering a second phase. We're gonna do a causal analysis. We're entering an AB phase where in about, three to six months, we'll have results. But what we're doing here is trying to strengthen leaders' emotional intelligence and seeking a correlation and a causal relationship with an increase in a sense of belonging with their direct reports. And we'll continue with this longitudinal study, follow the participants into many years. I'm going to give it's you- fascinating uh, what you're saying there because um, I know it works. You told me about some of the fascinating results you've had as a consequence of these steps, but help me here. When you struggle internally to gather momentum around emotional intelligence, because you must have felt a pushback where people are saying, what is, what is this all about? What's your trick to keep up the excitement around this way of thinking? I think it's just showing, uh, demonstrating its effectiveness. So I can tell you, um, you know, when I started sponsoring this longitudinal study, I did so with the approval of the customer relationship management president. And I needed the president's approval and buy-in. He's somebody who has invested in the development of leaders for many years. He is now the Progressive's claims president. And uh, this is a person who has deep commitment and investment in leaders. I think he personally felt a benefit of increasing his emotional intelligence, specifically empathy. His ability, you know, he's very high achieving, um, you know, very successful, and uh, in learning to understand how do other people feel? How can I put myself in their shoes and understand how do they experience this business and what they need to do to continue to be successful? he was able to increase his empathic skills through emotional intelligence. And what I think he found was that he had better relationships. His direct reports responded to him better. We all moved together as a team and we produced some phenomenal results in the time that he was our president. So mm -hmm. I think the proof happens when you experience it yourself. Mm -hmm. And so he's been a big supporter. Fascinating. Now, okay, coming up, what role should technology play 
in the future, maintaining the existence of empathy? Now, the answer from our guest will for sure surprise you. And do you know what, Dan? I want to come back to you for a second here because we cannot avoid the whole idea about technology, but it does seem like technology increasingly is giving us a handcuff on it. Now, from my own experience, I've certainly witnessed from all our clients around the world that they say their workload has gone up 20 to 25 percent over the last two years alone. People are simply just working more. Now, according to McKinsey, it means that they are more productive. Our claim is almost the opposite, that people are less productive because we're just moving all these PowerPoints and Excel spreadsheets around. And I would claim that most people are exhausted at 6 p.m. when they show, throw themselves at the couch and then it's time to do the work. This is technology and it's the flip side of it. Help me here to understand technology and empathy. Does that go together at all? What's this is all about? This is a really important question because so much of what's done at a distance, virtual work, uh, is done on teleconferences with a laptop or a machine that was not designed for it. So for example, I have this problem with you right now, Martin. If I look to camera, then we can have rapport because it's eye to eye. If I look at your face to see how you're feeling, to read your expressions, I lose the eye contact. If we were there in person, it wouldn't be a problem. We could have rapport very easily. So this means that given technology, you've got to make an extra effort to connect with the person. For example, you could reach out with a phone call. You could have a one-on-one -on -one instead of just seeing a person in a meeting. But I think it's now more important for people on the same team, for leaders to make that extra effort to connect with the person. Okay, so right, Marshall, I know you have a question for Dan. So before I shoot loose, over to you. Well, you know, I, I really have a question for Sharon, and that is, you know, Sharon, I'm going to make a prediction. You're going to be getting some pushback, and I'm going to make a second prediction. I think everything you say is going to work. I think, uh, from my experience, the problem is not understanding that it's doing it. I think you're going to document it does work. I love what you're doing. I love you having the courage to do it. I'm going to warn you in advance. You're going to get pushback from some people who get bad scores. You're going to have to confront some real executives. And some of them are going to be real powerful and they are not going to love you. So my question is, which is hard for an HR person because you're not a line manager, how are you going to deal with it? Well, if you permit me to step back just a minute, Marshall, I'll let you know that we actually at Progressive, when I first started my career in the commercial lines business, we used your coaching methodology. And it was very powerful because it in it involved others. We selected stakeholders. We right. selected behaviors we wanted to change. We invited observation real time. Real and time. Said, right? And what we said is, when you receive feedback, feed forward, right? Uh, pay attention to the information versus your own instincts for defensiveness. Right. And that whole enterprise of engaging others to help you get better right. and you accepting the feedback that you're getting to use it feed forward right. and just pay attention to that information. It got you, it made you better. Yeah. And the proof was in the ability to get better. So when I get pushback, I go back to how are you today versus before the uh, training and use of emotional intelligence. And I think most people, including our, you know, a current claims president will say that the work on emotional intelligence, empathy in particular, has made mm -hmm. him a more powerful, more caring leader that has made him more successful. So that's what I would say. Proof is in the pudding. <laughs> 